All right, guys, great. So, so thank you for coming today. Um, and thank you again for those of you who asked that I, that I do these during the term. It's been really nice to be back in here. And so I look forward to it. This is the last one, though, uh, of this term. So um, let's have some fun, I guess. Uh, I tried to create one at this point that would kind of bring together. OK, th yeah, for those of you coming, if you don't mind the other way, that'd be great. Uh, to try to bring together a number of the topics that, that you guys have come into contact with throughout this term. And I want to end this thing with a little bit of a big picture that I hope will kind of connect a lot together and kind of bring you to that sort of, OK, where are you now in your understanding of, of human psychology? Um, so that's the goal of this. Now, now I went a little dramatic here. Um, with Jekyll and Hyde, as we'll get into, and, and I didn't realize that first song I played that it's actually a verb now. You can Jekyll and Hyde somebody, I guess. Um, and of course, the reference in that song was to um, somebody she was dating, I assume, who was one way one day and completely different the other day. Uh, and so he was Jekyll and Hyding her, sometimes being nice, sometimes being a jerk. Um, okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, the original story, though, is a little different, a little more subtly different different and um, I think really relevant to the lecture I want to give you today. So that's where I kind of want to start, but I will go quickly by this next screen here. Um, is there a link to view the lecture? Uh, yes, so those of you watching in the live stream, there is a link to view the lecture. I posted it on an announcement just a little bit ago. So if you look at your announcements, you should be able to click in. So this is something, by the way, that you guys can do stuff with and those watching at home can as well. And basically the idea is if you now look at your Top Hat app, you will see something that says back chat. And if you touch on the back chat, you can type things in here. And if you type things in here, you will see them appear behind me. Uh, and you will also see, as is the case for all of these, that there's no identifying information on it. So uh, nobody knows who typed what. Um, it's just stuff here. Now what you can also do, yeah, I missed the lectures a little bit too. What you can also do is upvote what somebody else said with just the, the thumbs up. Uh, so if somebody asks a question or brings up an issue that you would like me to respond to in some way, then like that. Uh, my version of it up here sorts these according to likes. So I have the most liked up top. And so what I will do is stop at various points in the lecture and take a look. Uh, and if there's questions or issues you want me to address, then I'll be able to see them from here and, and we'll go from there. Okay? You can also use this just to chat with each other, post your thoughts or comments about what you're hearing if you want. So it's just sort of a communal space um, that we have. Okay. Cool. Let's get into the lecture proper then. You might remember when um, we were talking a little bit about uh, just that time in our history when humans started to kind of view themselves as, as maybe biological machines, maybe complex biological machines, you know, rather than that spirits in the material world. And one of the things I highlighted during those sort of late 1800s, which is where we're going to be here too, was how the literary world sometimes reflected the sort of burgeoning science of psychology. And specifically, I talked about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and the idea from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein that you could maybe take a bunch of human body parts from various places and sew them all together. And then if they get hit with electricity, AKA lightning, um, the body parts would become animated and they would become well, the monster, who actually was never named Frankenstein, by the way. Frankenstein was the doctor. Um, the monster was always the monster. Um, but we know him now as Frankenstein. Uh, and so what that highlighted at the time was that notion that we started to think we were machines. And just like machines, we could be disassembled and reassembled. And it also shows our burgeoning understanding that we were electrochemical machines that electricity was somehow important to how we function, and of course it is, uh, and that's why Frankenstein came to life with an electrical bolt, right? So, now let's turn to Jekyll and Hyde, and you'll see it's roughly the same time, roughly the same sort of time period, late 1800s. Again, should remind you of sort of the birth of psychology. Wilhelm Wundt was sort of going, um, you know, doing his thing at this time, and this is a time when we were starting to understand that machinery a little bit. And Jekyll and Hyde kind of reflects that in a different way. I don't show, I'm not sure how connected Robert Louis Stevenson was to science, but I think he was connected to himself. And he sensed this, what many of us sense, is that 
maybe there's not really one of us. Maybe there's two of us. Hence me, just the two of us uh, playing that song. Uh, and I've come to believe this really strongly. In fact, when I look at a lot of psychology, I really see it as a dance between two different forces. One that's very primitive, AKA Mr. Hyde, uh, and one that's much more refined and recent, AKA Dr. Jekyll. So that was the Jekyll and Hyde. Just in case any of you guys don't know the Jekyll and Hyde story, the idea is that there's this doctor, Dr. Jekyll, very well respected member of the community, etc. He has a lab in his basement. By the way, why does he have a lab in his basement? Isn't that weird? It wasn't weird in the late 1800s. Science was a hobby, mostly, in the late 1800s. There weren't universities with labs, you know, when full of scientists like there are today. Most of the scientists did science in their backyard or their hobby. Uh, Darwin, you know, it was his garden, was his lab for, to a large extent. And so we hear the story of Jekyll, who has a lab in his basement, and he's playing with various chemicals and stuff, because chemistry was big at the time, and he creates this potion. And at one point he decides to drink this potion. And when he drinks it, he transforms from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. Uh, Mr. Hyde being a much more primitive, self-focused, aggressive kind of version of Jekyll. A much more primitive, primitive sort of animalistic version of Dr. Jekyll. And so now we see these two characters, but it's the same body. Two characters living within the same body. Now Dr. Jekyll turns into Mr. Hyde and then turns back to Dr. Jekyll. He's one or the other. But I'm going to suggest we have a Jekyll and Hyde within us and they're both kind of there all the time, but if one of them's ever going to overpower the other, Dr. Jekyll will lose almost every time. Mr. Hyde is the more powerful. Uh, and so we're going to talk about this in a, in a few different psychology contexts just to kind of get you used to this. Uh, and, but mostly I'm going to focus on memory and we'll get into issues like deja vu um, and various other things that reflect um, this dual basis of responding that we'll talk about. Okay, so first of all, I mean, some of you, when you hear that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you may think Freud a little bit. And there is almost a connection, you know, I talked to you about the id, the ego, and the superego. The id, that primitive part of us that just wants things and wants it now. Well, that's kind of like Hyde. Except when we scientists now think of that, we think more of the limbic system. So the limbic system, core of our brain, very, very primitive. You know, it's been around for a long, long time in evolutionary terms. One of the ways we know this is virtually every animal species has a limbic system that's not that different from our own. So it's a very sort of common design that's used all through the animal kingdom. And we know it's critical to survival, um, that it handles a lot of um, our behaviors. It controls a lot of our behaviors, especially those that reflect sort of instinct and I'm going to be making, you know, reflexes, instinct, and I'm going to be making a bit of a big deal out of habit to you. Because when it's instinct and reflexes, it sounds like it's all very animalistic. But you'll see when we get to habits, it's a little different. Um, and, and this is the part that controls our habits, too, and oversees our habits. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. It is very primitive. Um, and, and it is sort of literally in the center of our brain, in the core of our brain. Now. It's kind of like Freud's id, um, because it is base, it's focused on basic survival sort of stuff most of the time, um, other than the habits, which is going to take a little different direction. So who's the Dr. Jekyll then? The doctor, so I'm just hearing, is the sound, so I see, is the sound really gargled for anyone else? Um, and I see three votes on that. Um, any reason why, so I assume this is the live stream, because it sounds fine in here. I'll just mention that to you. You can poke around and see if you can track anything out. Okay, so the frontal lobes are much more recent in our brain, much more recently evolved. In fact, you know, if you ever look at any of those depictions of humanity or human beings going through the various stages, um, you know, from Neanderthal up to Homo sapiens sapiens, for example, that what they often show is their head, and they show that in a lot of the older models of human beings, our foreheads were quite slanted backwards kind of like they are for a chimpanzee. You know, they start at the brow ridge and then slant back quite a bit. But with each successive variant of our species, our forehead has come more and more straight up. 
um, which is really what it is for most of us now, a fairly straight kind of forehead. So what that's done is it's created more room in the skull for this blue stuff here, the frontal lobes. And this is what we have more than any other animal. Um, it's more complex, we have more complex wiring, we, we actually have more complex, uh, sort of more frontal lobe, especially relative to our body size, right? So when, that's what we often compare is brain to body, so that you know, something like a whale, a blue whale, maybe a blue whale has more frontal lobes, because it's huge, it's got more of everything, right? But when you look at it relative to the, its body size, it's a much smaller proportion. Ours is the largest. This is where we do all of our rational thought, our complex strategic kind of thinking. And this is the part of us we embrace. We think of this as us, right? We have goals. What do we want to do? How do we achieve those goals? What are the things that we do to get from where we are now to where we want to be? That all feels like ourselves planning and strategizing and working out stuff. And in fact, we, we come to a point where we probably start to believe that almost all of our behavior is the result of sort of rational thought. Um, we're doing things for a reason. But I'm going to argue to you today that in fact that's probably a very small part of your behavior. That the biggest part of your behavior is probably controlled by Mr. Hyde. Um, and that Mr. Hyde is a dominant force even though we really kind of again embrace the Dr. Jekyll in us all. Okay, so let's go with this a little bit. Um, I'm going to start just where the place you know and then I want to build off this. So when I talk about Jekyll and Hyde this way, you're probably thinking, and rightfully, sympathetic nervous system. Um, so that's where the limbic system is. That includes the amygdala, the hippocampus, all those areas. And the story I told you when we talked about all this is that a core part of that system is keeping us alive when we're under threat. So for example, if these guys were taking pictures of some bears, everything was fine, but then suddenly that bear starts approaching them, um, especially in a sort of menacing way at all, then their amygdalas were triggered, they'll say, oh, oh, danger here, and they will either choose to fight or flee. In this case, they're clearly choosing flee. Um, so these four people are now running for their lives. And I told you how, you know, when that sympathetic nervous system is triggered, you get extra strength because you have all this oxygen to your, to your muscles, and you, in fact, run faster than you've ever ran. Or if you're fighting, you fight better than you've ever fought because you have all this power. That's one face of Dr. Jekyll, is in situations like this, Dr. Jekyll keeps us alive. Sorry, Mr. Hyde. I just said Dr. Jekyll twice, I meant Mr. Hyde. So the more primitive side of us comes to the fore and takes over and keeps us alive in those situations. Um, it gets in the way sometimes in other situations, this sort of primitive part. And I'm going to mention this one just so you kind of know it. Because you can start, once you start thinking about humans the way I'm going to talk about them today, as having that rational part of them, the Dr. Jekyll, and the more primitive part, the Mr. Hyde, you're going to start seeing this in, in people you know. And you've probably have, if you've been in a relationship, you've certainly seen the hide in that person. So if you are ever in an, a fight of this sort, an argument with somebody that gets really heated, you know, at some point it's hide on hide here. And that's what we're seeing here. Both of these people have clearly, their sympathetic nervous system is completely engaged. They're angry. When they get angry that, that way, that's the limbic system that's now taking over. Frontal lobes, in fact, have less blood flow during these periods. And this causes a problem because Hyde's all, all about the fight, right? Hyde's ready to fight. If you're, if you're going to piss me off this much, I'm going to come at you. And the problem is it's fighting without the frontal lobes. So one of the things the frontal lobes does that's really important for us is it stops us from doing things that would be not good if we did them. So every now and then we have this thought, oh, I might want to do whatever, but we have our conscience or this little voice in our head that says, no, 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 keep that to yourself. Shut up, don't do that. If you do that or say that or whatever out loud, people are going to judge you and you're going to be judged poorly. You know, that's not going to be a good look. So, so don't do that. Or there could be long-term consequences to doing that. And so you inhibit a behavior. When you're in this mode, you don't inhibit very well. Your frontal lobes are shut down. And one of the most common side effects of this is you say things that you wish you hadn't said later. Um, you say things with the intent to hurt uh, because that's what Hyde does, 
right? If, if, you, if you've got me whatever, and, I'm, and this is that primitive side, and we're in a fight, well, a fight is about throwing blows. And if it's not physical blows, it'll be psychological blows. I will say things to you that will hurt. And, and that's how I'm going to win this fight. But of course, you may win the fight, but you'll lose the war. Because once you've said those hurtful things, you can't take them back. Uh, and so very often, you know, you're, that, that can really be a, a harm of a relationship. So that's an example of, of where this sort of hide thing can really mess us up in the current world. But again, this is the dramatic hide. This is the really primitive part coming out. There's a much more complex story here and a much more subtle story. And that's what I want to move towards now. And it really has to do with getting to this notion of habit. Because hide doesn't just come to life when there's threat. Hide is around all the time. As, and you'll get a good sense of this by the end of this lecture. Um, and, it, and it oversees a lot of our behaviors that are not about fighting or fleeing, but in fact are about just functioning smoothly without bothering the conscious mind. So our conscious resources are limited. And our brain has learned through Hyde that, hey, I can do a lot of things without bothering that conscious mind. I have to bother it at first. But once we can set up a habit, once we do things in a certain regular way, then I can take over. And consciousness need not be there. And I'm faster and better than that anyway. So consciousness I'm kind of using with Dr. Jekyll. Consciousness, Dr. Jekyll, frontal lobes, all those things are going to be tied up. Okay? So let me give you a sense of this. Um, from this example uh, that, that we did yesterday. And I found out I could do this yesterday, which is, uh, I don't know how I did it. OK. Um, I found out I could somehow, here we are, edit in PowerPoint. Excellent. All right, the problem was I didn't know how to get out of this once I did it. But yeah, that's all right. Um, OK. So let me go down to my slide that I'm at here, and let me bring this up. OK. I'm going to keep it like this for a moment so you can see what I want to show you. OK, so I want to talk to you about how, from very early in your life, your interactions with the world have taught your brain a truth that your brain now has incorporated as a habit that it uses to interpret other things in the world. That sounds really confusing. Let's start here. This isn't really, I wish this was a beautifully round thing. It's not a beautifully round thing, but it's sort of a round thing. And here's the point I want to make with this. We live in a world where the light almost always comes from above us. When we're outdoors, it's the sunshine. When we're indoors, it's the electric light. And we almost always have it above us. And what that means is there's certain things that just happen in that sort of world. If something is sort of bulging towards you like this, if it's what we call convex, coming towards you, then when you look at this, what you notice is that it's pretty light on the top, but it's pretty dark on the bottom. Okay? And that's just true. Anything that will bulge this way with the light above will be light on the top and sort of darker on the bottom. If we made this instead concave, so bulging, being like a cave, bulging away from you, notice the opposite is true now. Now the bottom part has a lot of light, and this part is in shadow. OK, so your brain has noticed this about the world and has seen this. And now when we present two-dimensional things, it's got this habit of thinking of things that way, of, of analyzing them that way, and ultimately you perceiving them that way. So here's what I want to do with this. I'm going to start by spinning it this way. OK, so what do you see here? Eh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be exact. It works, <laughs> whatever. I assume for most of you guys, you see this one as convex, coming towards you. This one as concave, going away from you. But now pick one of them and keep your eyes on it and, and note what it is right now. Is it convex or concave right now? OK, now I just spun it upside down. What happened? Well, nothing happened to it. right? It didn't change. It's a two-dimensional figure. Nothing changed with it other than me spinning it upside down. But what you probably find is that the one that was away from you is now coming towards you and vice versa. So let's just play with this one on the left. This one right now is convex. It's coming towards us. If we watch it and go over, 
Once we get here, now it's concave. It's going away from us. Why do we see it one way and then the other way? Well, because I already kind of told you, it's all about the light and the shadow. And so our brain has a habit. When it sees something that has light on the top and shadow on the bottom, we perceive it as coming towards us. But when the opposite is true, shade on the top, light on the bottom, we perceive it as going away from us. So simply reversing it changes how we perceive that. So that's Dr. Jekyll too. Sorry, freaking heck, I'm gonna have to watch out for this. <laughs> that's Mr. Hyde too. You know, once your, your brain starts to realize this, and this is kind of what some people will call unconscious processing, unconscious perceptual influences, that now your mind has learned that fact and it uses that fact to interpret new stuff. And it becomes a habit of how it processes it. And your conscious mind is not involved. It just kind of processes it and then gives it to your conscious mind at the end. This is what you see, concave or convex. I've done the pre-processing for you. Uh, and so Hyde is doing a lot of these things sort of under the hood all the time. And that's what we're gonna kind of continue on with. Now, I'm just gonna continue with the PowerPoint um, as, as I did yesterday. Um, no, I'm not. If not if I can go back. I'm just not sure how I can go back to the top hat thing. Just because if I do do that, okay, good. If I do go back, then we will lose um, that back channel. In fact, we probably already did. So I'm just gonna very quickly go through these slides to get back to where we were, and the back channel should be alive again. Yep. And, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh, something went wrong. Oh, now I've done it. It's always fun to watch, hey, which presentation did you go in? I don't know if that's the right one or not. Oh my goodness. Always fun to watch profs struggle with technology. Let's get into the fifth. Okay, I don't know which present, it goes right into a presentation. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, cool. So now let's go, go sort of more general. Now that you have this notion that your, your mind um, is able to do things sort of in the absence of consciousness. Let me tell you how this plays out a little bit. We're gonna go into the memory world a little bit. And we're gonna start with an experience that you guys have had, something like this. It's kind of famous in cognitive psychology worlds as the butcher in the bus uh, phenomenon. But here's the idea, here's the story. And for you, it'll be different than a butcher in a bus. But I'm gonna give you the, the classic butcher in a bus notion. The idea here is you might be going onto a bus one day. And as you get on that bus, you notice somewhere at the back of that bus, there's this, this guy with his family. And maybe they're all going to the beach. So they got sort of beach wear on and they're doing family stuff, uh, et cetera. But when you look and you see that person, you're thinking, I know that person. Where do I know them from? And so whenever we're in this state, we have this weird behavior that you probably know, um, sort of furtive glances, where we kind of look over at that person out of the corner of our eye or really quickly, but we don't look too much, because if we look too much, they're gonna look at us, and we think we know them, which probably means they know us. Um, so if they recognize us, and we don't recognize them, we're gonna feel like idiots, right? And so we don't really wanna engage them until we figure out who they are. And so we sit there and we look out of the corner of our eye and think, I know that guy, I know, who is that guy? I know I know him. So first of all, this is a state we call familiarity without recollection. And we're gonna talk a little bit about familiarity here. And the idea behind familiarity without recollection is that somehow you know you know that person. We'll talk about how in just a moment. But you also know that you can't consciously remember where you know them from. So you have a feeling of past experience, but without any conscious sort of experience to actually connect it to. And that drives us crazy, for one thing. It makes us go into this situation, where do I know that person from? And we start obsessing about it, and we start trying to think about it. Now maybe, at some point, for whatever reason, something clicks. And you go, oh, I know who that person is. That person is the butcher in the store where I go. And I didn't recognize them, because they're usually behind the counter. 
and they're usually wearing a white outfit with blood all over it. And they're usually, you know, in that context. And that's where I see them. And now, because this person has changed their outfit and changed their context, that was enough to throw my conscious mind, that my Dr. Jekyll. That was enough for me to suddenly have a failure of conscious memory. But his face and that, that I'd perceived many times before was still feeding this feeling of familiarity. Okay, so that's a case we're sometimes in. And it really shows that there's these two distinct memory influences. Familiarity, which is going to be more Mr. Hyde, and recollection, conscious recollection, more Dr. Jekyll. And I'll just show you this one paper to kind of give you a sense that, you know, even though this was a, a big deal in the 60s when it first came out, 2005, um, it's still being researched and people are trying to understand what factors are critical to allowing conscious recollection to, to come into play. So you see here people are playing with changes in hair color um, of characters. Is that enough if a hair color is different to throw off conscious recollection, etc.? So people are still doing a lot of um, studying of these two different forms of memory. Okay, how does this happen? I want to get to deja vu, and so in order to get to deja vu, we have to spend a little bit of time on the theory here so that you have a sense of it. Um, and the claim is just this, and, and you had this already when I talked about the, how the brain likes to make sense of input, and by making sense, we mean connects with previous experiences, similar to previous experiences. Okay, so now imagine, let's just take this example as an example. Um, imagine you'd never seen this word example before, which is kind of weird, but let's imagine it was a brand new word. And the first time you saw it, it would be really hard to process something brand new that you'd never seen before. Why? Because you don't have any previous experience with that item. And so you can only process it sort of from the top, uh, from the bottom up, rather, you know, to figure out what that word is. But after you see it over and over again, the claim is once you've seen it once, you've now stored a memory trace of that experience. And so the second time you see it, now memory can start to help you figure out what's out there. So we have that top-down process now at play. And what that means is you'll process it a little quicker because you have support for memory. Now, the second time you process it, now you've got two memory experiences with it. And so when it comes the third time, memory is going to be even better at helping you. And so the claim is, if there's something that you perceive over and over and over again, every time you're going to be able to recognize what it is quicker. We call this perceptual fluency. You can perceive what's out there more and more fluently the more times you experience it. Versus, for example, this one over here, where it's still the same word, example, but we're always presenting it in a different way way. Um, and because the form of it keeps changing, we don't get that same sort of memory boost we do when it stays the same, like that. So when you read these, they're always disfluent. It's always kind of hard to get it, but this one gets easier and easier and easier every time. Okay. The claim is we can feel that fluency. When we, and, and let me just give you a couple of examples of that. We can feel it and we can use it. Um, Okay, um, there's an interesting question about fight or flee, but I, but I want to sit on it for a moment. Um, let's imagine the following thing. You go to a, a friend's place. You've never been there before. You just enter their, their house or their apartment or whatever, but it turns out they have a, a, a picture on the wall exactly like a picture on your wall. The claim is your mind will be drawn to that. Why? because you're going to process that much more fluently than the rest of the room. The rest of the room is brand new. You've never seen it before. And so your, your brain is slowly processing it. But that picture that you've seen a hundred times comes really quick. You can process that and recognize that really quick. And so you've got a really fluent processing thing happening in the context of a bunch of disfluent. And the claim is that draws the mind and you would be like, whoa, that's kind of cool. We got the same picture. Or the opposite could happen. You could go back to your place and that picture, somebody changed it. Somebody put a new picture there. 
And so now you're in your place, so everything is fluently perceived because you've been there a hundred times, you know where everything is, except for that picture that's really being disfluently perceived. Um, and because it's new, it wasn't there before. And once again, the claim is your eye would be drawn to that. Your mind and your eye would be drawn to that. And so the claim is this perceptual fluency. We can feel it. It feels like familiarity or disfamiliarity. You know, in the second case where that picture is being processed non-fluently, it's like an unfamiliar picture. Where, where'd that come from? I didn't expect to see that here. Um, but we can feel how fast our brain is flu uh, processing stuff, and that comes through as familiarity. Okay, so let's just talk about a few memory phenomena now with all this, this theoretical background. One we've already talked about, the mere exposure effect. When I talked about anti-vaxxers and why anti-vaxxers are so sure they are right, they are so convinced that their interpretation of reality is the right one and our interpretation is the wrong one. Um, where do we come to our interpretation? Largely by watching the news and other so-called reliable sources that we've been used to getting our information from. But in the modern world, there's been this social media presence. And what happens in the social media presence, and let me just ask you, there's a, yeah, let's just have a bit of fun here for a second. There's a video. I don't know if I can find it. Um, um, what's, what do you call flight attendant um, airplane mask pilot? It should come up really quickly if I get this right. So there's one like this. So, so you see this one man in Trump gear booted from Southwestern flight. I don't know if I can find the other one, but I'm going to try to mention it because some of you should have seen it. And I'm curious how many of you have seen it, and then I'm curious about whether you know this, the rest of the story. So let's start with the scene. What this video shows is somebody on an airplane, a woman, who is upset because she was asked to sit beside somebody, and she believes that person is not vaccinated. Uh, and she doesn't want to sit beside him because she doesn't want to breathe the same air as him. And she's making a big fuss out of it. Uh, and she's basically demanding that the aircraft people check this person's vaccination status. She doesn't want to sit beside him until she knows that he's vaccinated. Who's seen that video? Anybody? One, two, three, four. Okay, so apparently it's hugely viral. Hugely viral. That's why I kind of was hoping to see all your hands go up. Yeah, we've all seen that video. Do any of you guys know the full story on that video, which is, it was created by a person, a guy, who just creates videos for clicks. So he hires actors, he does full sort of movie kind of stuff, and he creates these scenes. And in very small print, you can get the sense that this was a created scene, not a real thing that happened. But he intentionally doesn't want that to be obvious. He tries to make them look like it's real that this actually happened, and he wants them to be shocking, and he knows that anti-vaxxers and vaxxers are like this with each other, so he says, oh, if I have a video where, where I put those two together, we'll get lots of clicks. Why would he want lots of clicks? Advertising revenue. You get lots of money, right? If you produce videos that people click on, you get lots of money. That's his game. He's not an anti-vaxxer, he's not a vaxxer, he's a guy that wants to get rich producing videos that people click on. Uh, and so he's just sensitive to what the topics are, and he creates these. But the thing is, that was completely untrue. It was completely scripted and staged. And yet, those people who saw it, did you know that? Did anybody know that? Because the vast majority of people who see that video do not know that. It's not made obvious in any way. But they see it a lot. They may see a video like that sent to them by all kinds of their friends. Um, and the brain isn't good at this. So the brain kind of thinks, if you see something a lot or you hear something a lot, it's true. Because in a pre-social media world, that was kind of the way things worked, right? If, if something, if some fact reoccurred, it, you started to believe it was a fact. But now you can have something that's completely staged that goes viral. And what that means is people in that community are probably seeing this video posted by all sorts of people. The more you see something, the more you like it. Not you, well, yes, you, Mr. Hyde. This is a Mr. Hyde thing. So Mr. Hyde thinks, oh, if I see something a lot, especially if I see it from different places, and especially if I see it from people I trust and like, then I'm, I'm gonna trust and like it. 
Uh, and so the more you see it, the more you like it, the more you trust it. And, and social media has this ability now to have somebody see something a lot that's not true. And that's really what's messing up with a lot of people's idea of what is true or not anymore. They have trouble. So this is a, you know, that primitive part of our brain that's really getting in the way of rational thought um, because of the mere exposure effect. As long as those false lies are out there big time, they're going to be believed by a lot of people. So that's one basic effect. But let's do some of the more fun ones. Ah, fun. I like this one because it shows the battle between uh, Jekyll and Hyde in a clear way. And this is a sort of battle, I call it a battle, but it's not really a battle. It's just they're both contributing to behavior, um, yeah, sometimes in different ways. So let me give you the setup for this one. People first come to a lab. This is how labs were supposed to work before COVID, by the way. You'd come to a lab, you'd sit in front of a computer, and people, and the person might say, okay, I'm gonna show you a bunch of names. These are just names of people all I want you to do is press the space bar when you see each name. Um, by the way, these are all non-famous people. Okay, so you go through a list. Now, as you're going through that list, some of the names are presented just once, some of the names are presented four times. Okay, cool. So you go through, you see all those, those words. Now, either immediately after, or a day after, or further even, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but let's do the immediate after. So immediately after, you just saw the names, um, and now you're told, okay, here's another version of this. You're going to see names again, but we're going to, some of them will be the names you already saw, in fact, but we're going to intermix some new ones, including some really famous names and some new non-famous names. Okay, so, in, and what we want you to do now is to tell us whether you think each name is the name of a famous person or not. So you see the names and you either say famous or not famous, okay? Now, what do we see when we do this right after? This is going to be a world where Dr. Jekyll is largely in charge because you just saw those names. It wasn't very long ago and you're pretty good at remembering what you just saw. And so what you're seeing here is the famous names in the red bar, the people are saying, yep, they're famous. So they're pretty good at getting those. About 65% of the famous names, they say, yep, those are famous people. But when we look at the other ones, what we see is if they were presented in the first part, especially if they're presented in four times, they're very unwilling to call those people famous. Why? Well, because they just saw those names and they were just told those were non-famous, especially the ones that were presented four times. Right? You see that name four times and you start to go, oh, okay, yeah, all right, I remember seeing that name. And now when it shows up on the second test, you're like, yeah, that was just in the first part. That's non-famous. So they're really good at calling the ones in the first part non-famous because they were told they were non-famous and they remember them being in the list. Now, you let just a day pass and you have a different group of people now do the same test but a day later. And what you see is a real change over here. Well, you see a change overall. You see a change here too. They're calling famous people famous less a day later. What does this reflect? Well, it probably reflects a certain, um, how, how well, we call it response bias, but how willing are they to use that fame category to say, yes, I think that's famous. They, they don't want to make mistakes and call non-famous people famous or they try to avoid it. So because this is a more challenging condition, it was a day since they saw these, they're less, they, they hit the famous ones less. But the important part is these ones, and especially this one times one, and, and, and the four times one at a further time frame that I'll tell you about. But let's just do this one for now. What is happening here? What's happening here is those ones that were just presented once, a day ago, we're starting to not consciously remember those being on that list. We're losing our memory of those items. Remember Ebbinghaus, we lose conscious memory pretty quick. Uh, and so now the four times one, we're still able to remember because they were presented four times. But that one times one, we're not able to remember consciously. And what we start to see now is relative to the brand new non-famous ones, we think these guys are famous now. Those ones that we saw a day ago, but we've forgotten that we consciously saw, we've consciously forgotten that we've seen them, now we think they're famous. Now we're taking that familiarity from seeing them a day ago 
and we're, we're using that to support a fame judgment. So we think, okay, this must be fame because it's familiar. So the story here is, you know, this is what happens to our memories over time, that we have this experience and the conscious part of that experience can disappear, but the unconscious part can linger and in fact become stronger. So let me attach this to something you care about, multiple choice tests. Have you ever heard that saying, if you do a multiple choice question and you don't consciously know which answer is right, go with the one that feels right. I'm going to tell you, do that. Don't second guess it. Do, and, and just go with the first one. So often people pick that and then they'll say, well, I don't really know that though. And then they'll second guess themselves and they'll pick something else. Don't second guess yourself. If you don't know consciously what the right answer is, let Mr. Hyde answer. <laughs> so that's your Dr. Jekyll that doesn't know. You know, my Dr. Jekyll can't remember reading the part, but if this one feels better, well, maybe that's because I did read it, but I've consciously forgotten it. But having read it, there's still that influence of familiarity. So it pulls my attention to option C for whatever reason, pick option C. Okay, this is the way that familiarity kind of continues to influence us once conscious memory is kind of gone. By the way, if you take this study out and rather than testing them one day later, you test them one week later, you start to see a really interesting thing. The four times becomes the one they call famous a lot of the new items. Of these items, eventually this bar is bigger than the one times bar. Why? because you saw it four times. So there was a lot of perceptual fluency building up. And once you lose the conscious memory of that, then this is a really powerful item. It feels really familiar um, and it starts to feel really famous. So kind of cool. Okay. Finally, let's do deja vu. Everything comes with a bit of a story. So here's the story. Um, this is, this is always like when old people, when I was a kid, I walked through snow that was up to whatever. Uh, when I was a kid, we had one television. Um, it was my dad's television. It had two channels and there was no internet. <laughs> so that was our form of um, entertainment in the evening with our family was watching TV. But if you're in my household, you watched what dad watched because it was ultimately his TV and he worked hard all day. And when he came home at night, he decided what we, what we watched and we just sat and watched it. Uh, and we also, by the way, did not talk unless it was a commercial. If you talk when it's not a commercial, you hear it from my dad. <laughs> you know, full focus on the show until it's a commercial, then you can talk. Um, okay, he loved crime stuff. So one of the shows that he loved was The Streets of San Francisco. Some of you might know Michael Douglas now. You might know him as this sort of 85-year-old, gray-haired kind of guy. Um, that's Michael Douglas in the day as a, as a much younger actor. Um, and the, these guys were just detectives set in San Francisco, and they would solve crimes in San Francisco. Okay, and so Dad would watch this TV show, which means I would watch this TV show. Um, the TV show would obviously include a bunch of scenes of San Francisco. It was set there. It was shot there. And so they would, of course, be chasing criminals or doing whatever, but when they were doing that stuff, they might be going down streets like this, um, which I would have seen, but I wouldn't have really thought too much about as a kid, right? Because I'm watching the show. You're following the show, and you're just sort of half kind of thinking about the context in which the acting is going on. Okay. Fast forward, let's say, 20 years. 20 years after I was hanging out with Dad watching TV, I finally, for the first time, get to go to San Francisco. Um, I've never been to San Francisco before, let's say. While I'm in San Francisco, I maybe come out some alleyway and I look down the road and I see this. When I see this, I get this creepy feeling. It's like, I've seen that before. Everything feels just right. I get this feeling like, no, I've been right in this position. I've been right here looking down this road before. Um, well, I have, right? Sort of, up there. I've seen that road depicted from that angle on TV, but that was 20 years ago, and I probably wasn't paying attention. So do I make that connection? Do I consciously go, oh yeah, I remember watching that with my dad 20 years ago on TV? Probably not, right? That is too far away um, now. My conscious recollection is gone. So what do we assume then? What's the next rational thing? 
I don't know how rational it is, <laughs> but this is where we start going with this, right? Ooh, maybe I dreamed I was here and my dream has come true. Or, ah, oh, past life, I, I was here. I know I was here. I can feel I was here. So if it wasn't this life, if I've never been to San Francisco in this body before, I must have been here in a different body, in a previous life, because I know I have seen this before. I can feel the perceptual fluency. Right? I can feel the familiarity. It was just everything was where I expected it to be. It just felt too right. I can tell I've seen it before. And of course I have, but I've forgotten where. And so now, because I've forgotten where, I make these crazy assumptions. Okay? And so this is deja vu is sort of that Mr. Hyde kind of feeling of familiarity again, coming out in a strange and interesting way. Mm. I'm, going, I'm going to still resist answering that question. I'm going to wait till the end, but I love the question, but I'm going to, I'm going to resist. Um, I just want to stay in the flow of this. There's another kind of deja vu you guys probably know. And I want to give you the sense of this one too. This deja vu happens when we're talking to somebody often. And we're just having a conversation, everything's fine, but we hit this point where we say something, and as they start to respond, we feel like we know exactly what they're going to say. And they say it. And we're like, whoa. And sometimes this lasts for a while. We have a little bit of a back and forth where it's like, I knew what you were going to say. And then I knew what I was going to say back. And then I knew what you were going to say back. And then at some point it goes away. But there's this little period where you're like, ooh, this is kind of spooky. You know, what's going on? Again, did we dream this before? Did we whatever? Similar kind of story, um, but a little different. And, and to, to give you the context, here's, here's how I like to present it. We listen to weather people tell us what the weather is going to be. We don't think they're going to be 100% accurate, right? We don't think they can be 100% accurate. Predicting weather is not um, something we can do so well that we can be 100% accurate. So what we're really expecting is our weather people to give us a rough idea of what the weather is going to be like. But we fully expect they're going to get stuff wrong. Now let's assume there's this new weather person. And this new weather person, whatever they say, turns out to be exactly right. New CP24 weather person. They say, tomorrow it's going to be this degrees, and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon a rain shower will begin, but by 4 o'clock it'll clear up and we'll have beautiful sun. And everything happens just like they say. Every day. How many days before we start thinking they're in league with the devil? <laughs> you know, they, they shouldn't be able to do that. That's impossible. There's something freaky going on with that weather person. Okay, so now let's go back to the conversations. The claim is the brain thinks of those largely the same way. Whenever we're interacting with other people, especially people we know well, we use something that we call our theory of mind. We form a theory of how they think and how they respond to things. We get to know them. We use that for things like, I want to buy this person a gift. What's a gift that I think they will really enjoy, that will really make them happy? Well, if we know them really well and we have a sense of who they are and etc., you know, we can use that to do things like give them a gift. We can also use it, by the way, to deceive them. Once we know them well and we know how they think, we can play them in a sense. We can feed them false information that we know they will run with in a certain direction or whatnot. So this theory of mind is very important, but here's the thing. Like the weatherman, we know it's just a theory and it's only half good. So when we're talking to somebody, the idea is your brain always likes to predict. So when you say something, your brain is predicting how that person is going to respond. But it's expecting, just like the weather, to get it roughly right. Every now and then, it might get it exactly right. It knows exactly, you know, it thinks she's going to say something like X, and she says X. And then your brain's like, oh, okay, now if I say this, she's going to say something like Y. And she says Y. You know, not Y plus or minus, but Y. She says exactly what our brain predicts she will say. And that's odd, especially if it happens once or twice or three times in a row. And so that oddity is picked up by the sort of hide in us. Like, whoa, there's something odd going on. And it gives us that feeling of strangeness, of unexpectedness. And that's another way where we start saying, wow, I knew too well what you were going to say. And once again, we go to dreams, we go to whatever.
Okay? So the claim of both of these is that the source of these effects is your unconscious mind, that sort of hide part. Your conscious mind tries to figure it out, but can't in some cases. You know, doesn't understand the, some of the things I told you about the you know, roughly right, etc., or some experience you've forgotten. And so the conscious mind goes to dreams, goes to past lives, goes to whatever, tries to come up with an explanation, a rational explanation um, of the phenomenon. So these two different sides of you at play, the familiarity and the conscious mind. Okay, a couple of other examples just to round things up. But I want to bring this more to the neuroscience, neuropsych kind of side of things. Um, okay. Let's start over here. Um, and I want to talk about Alzheimer's, or Alzheimer's, uh, amnesia a little bit. As you know by now, I hope, there are two distinct kinds of amnesia. Uh, retrograde amnesia, or what I call soap opera amnesia. Why do I call it that? Well, because soap operas love it. Um, so you know the story of retrograde amnesia. Somebody in the story who has, a, who has a, let's say, a wife and kids and is a very happy character in the story gets hit on the head sometime, bonk. They get hit on the head, suddenly they don't remember anything about themselves. They don't know who they are, nothing. All of their memories of their past is gone. And maybe they woke up in a ditch, I don't know, a, 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 a town over from where they live. And of course, being in a soap opera, they quite quickly establish a new relationship with somebody and have a bunch of kids. Um, and then they get their memory back. And now they suddenly remember who they were, and they had a wife and a bunch of kids, and who they are, and they have a wife and a bunch of kids, and now they have to sort it out because it's a soap opera. Okay, so that's the idea that you could get in a hit on the head and lose all your memories of the past. That happens. It happens a lot with car accidents and things like that. It tends to be short term. You tend to regain your memories pretty quickly. But the other one is almost more interesting. The other one is called anterior grade amnesia. And that's losing the ability to lay down any new memories. You can remember your past fine, but from some critical point onward, you can't lay down any new memories. The only memories you have are from before that point. So the classic example of this um, was something called Korsakoff syndrome. And again, another kind of interesting story. Um, Korsakoff may sound to you like a Russian name. It is, or it's a Russian doctor. Uh, and he was seeing patients that had this problem. All of these patients um, had reached a point where they can no longer remember anything that happens to them. They remember their past, but new things they couldn't remember. So he tried to figure out why. Turned out every one of them was an alcoholic. Um, and when he kind of drilled down, essentially what they were doing was surviving on vodka. Okay, so vodka was cheap in Russia. Food was not so plentiful. And so a lot of people drank a lot. Now, alcohol contains a lot of calories. So you can sustain your body on alcohol, sort of. Calorically, you can. But you're going to miss a lot of vitamins and nutrients. And specifically for this story, you're going to miss thiamine. You won't have thiamine in alcohol. The hippocampus needs thiamine um, to, to survive. And so when you stop getting it, your hippocampus slowly shrivels up and dies. And it's the hippocampus that is the part of your brain that you use to store new memories. So basically, these people were killing their hippocampuses by, by just surviving on alcohol. If they had at least done alcohol and vitamins, they might have been OK. <laughs> but they didn't do the vitamins. They just did the alcohol. Um, so this was a very interesting group of people. Now, is their memory totally gone then? Can they not remember anything? Well, it turns out that's not true. Famous stories from Clapper Ray in the 1900s. Clapper Ray, being a neuropsychiatrist you see here, uh, who worked in a, in a place where there were a lot of people suffering various health conditions, including a lot of amnesias, a lot of Korsakoff's patients. And he had the habit, Clapper Ray, of um, greeting each patient every morning with a handshake. Good morning, I'm Dr. Clapper Ray. And of course, they didn't know who he was, right? Because they didn't meet him until after their problem, and so they never remembered him. They, every, even though they met him every day, they didn't remember meeting him ever. Um, no conscious memory. But here's what he did that was kind of weird. One day, he decided to put a little pin in his hand. And he went to, to one of the, the women there, and he said, good morning, I'm Dr. Clapper, I'm your whatever. And of course, this is an instinct, right? If somebody, this is something we all have to deal with with COVID now, right? When somebody puts their hand out to you, you want to very naturally shake their hand. 
Um, and we, we've been inhibiting that for a long time now. And I'm finding after COVID, by the way, that's hard. When I meet somebody, that's, that's a habit I have. So at any rate, he puts his hand out, and of course, she takes his hand to shake it, but when she does, she gets this pinprick in the middle of her hand, which hurts, okay? Now, the next day, Clapperay comes to her and says, good morning, I'm Mr. Clapperay, I'm your doctor, and what she does is go, hey, <laughs> why won't you shake my hand? I don't know. And when she was pushed, she said, Sometimes people are dishonest. Sometimes it's kind of like she almost half has an idea, but she certainly doesn't say, because yesterday you stuck me with a pin, you jerk. You know, she doesn't have that memory, but she has some trepidation and she doesn't want to shake his hand. And that started the study of amnesics and what they could learn, even though they have no conscious memory. And it's pretty extreme. They can learn to do things like code in computer code. Every time you bring them to the lab, it's like you're teaching them the first time. They think, I've never been there. I don't know. I've never done any coding before. And you say, okay, let me teach you how to do some stuff. And what you find is day after day after day, they get better and better and better. Each day, they don't remember ever having done it before. They think it's the first time ever. But they learn quicker every time. And so it's like there's part of their brain, Mr. Hyde, that's still engaged. And things that you're learning about, things like operant conditioning and classical conditioning, you don't need your conscious mind for that. Your, your unconscious mind can learn that you behaved a certain way, there was a certain consequence. If you guys thought that, let, let's just take a moment with this. If you guys thought the story of operant conditioning was one where you said, oh, I chose to do that, this happened, and because that, of that, I am going to decide to do that again or do that less. This is not a conscious decision. These learning processes are not a result of you considering the consequences and consciously adjusting your behavior. This just happens. This is Mr. Hyde. Okay, the system does it. That's why they use this at SeaWorld, right? They can use it with all animals. We do dog training. We do all sorts of training with operant conditioning because you don't need a conscious mind to learn in that way. But you do to remember learning. And so a lot of these amnesias are simply Dr. Jekyll being taken out of the equation and yet this person's still being able to learn and do a bunch of stuff because Mr. Hyde is still there. Now, this is a common story. The conscious mind getting taken out, the unconscious one still being stronger and resilient. But there's one case I wanna tell you about where it's the opposite. First, I'm gonna tell you the one that's the same, and you've heard this one before, prosopagnosia. Um, I think you know prosopagnosia, that's the inability to consciously recognize faces that you should know. And so the, the classic example of prosopagnosia is if I suffered the right kind of damage to my brain, specifically to an area called the fusiform gyrus, um, if that area was damaged, then let's say my sister came to the foot of my bed while I was in the hospital, and she just stood there, didn't talk or didn't move because her, her voice or her movements I might recognize, but if she just stood there so that all I had is what she looked like, um, and if the doctor said, who is this? I would probably say something like, I don't know, I'm not sure, but she's either really famous or she's like a family member or something. So I could feel the fluency, I can feel the familiarity, she's very familiar, but I can't consciously re remember why. Okay, that's prosopagnosia. Now let me tell you the opposite one that's even creepier. And we don't see this happen very often, this is the only disorder I know of where it works, but it's something called Capgrass syndrome. Here's the famous horror story. There's a bunch of them with Capgrass syndrome. People who have Capgrass syndrome do strange things. But the most extreme and the most strange and the story we always tell in Intro Psych is the following. A woman who had damage to a certain part of her brain that, that's related to Capgrass syndrome um, comes home and not long after that, she kills her husband. And not only does she kill her husband, she cuts his head off. When they come to see her, and they can tell what she's done. They said, you, you killed your husband and cut his head off. She said, yep, I did. Well, no, I didn't really. And they said, well, what do you mean? No, you didn't. That's not my husband. And they said, what do you mean it's not your husband? Well, no, no, I know he looks just like my husband and all that, but I could tell. I was around him. He didn't feel right. You know, it just didn't, it wasn't him. I know, I know my husband and that wasn't him. I know he looks like him. I know he's the same height, the same weight, the same description, blah, 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 but that wasn't him. I also knew nobody would believe me because they don't know him as well as I do. 
And so that's why I cut off his head, to show you that it was either an alien inside of him or a robot. Turns out, neither. Oops. <laughs> I don't know if she said oops. But, but that's the idea. So what she had was recollection without familiarity, which is very odd. She could recognize who that person was, but he didn't feel right. Lost that sort of feeling of familiarity we have around people that we're comfortable with, that, that we're familiar with. That's the only case I know of a situation where somebody retained a conscious ability to recognize somebody, but lost the sort of unconscious, the familiarity. Um, so that's kind of an interesting uh, example. Okay, so I just want to pull this all together now really quickly and see if this makes sense to you as an overall story of a lot of what you've learned in this course. This is supposed to depict your brain in the middle. And what I'm implying here is there's parts of your brain, I called it the limbic system, but we're really being bigger here, but I, all the input from all the lobes goes through the limbic system, right? And it's the limbic system where the amygdala triggers things and stuff, so it's the, amygdala, it's the limbic system that really controls action, can control action. Um, and so we have you know, things that are hitting our brain that only the limbic system deals with, and then we have some here in the middle that's meant to represent the part that we're consciously processing in our frontal lobes, okay? So let's just see if this makes sense. There's an external world out there, but there's part of it we attend to. So as I'm moving my eyes around, the part of the world that I'm actively attending to in the textbook's langu language, that part is coming into my working memory, I'm just gonna tie some of these concepts together that you're dealing with. So that's sort of my conscious mind, my working memory, and so I can see that person. And if I have some goals related to that person, um, let me give you an example. In winter term, by the way, we were just talking about this in the faculty meeting, all students are going to have to wear masks. You're all going to be in here. And the question was, well, what does a prof do if a student does not have a mask on? Do we kick that person out? How do we, how do we police this? Let, uh, we don't know the answer, but let's say I'm looking around and let's say I see somebody without a mask and I know, oh, I have a goal of keeping this a safe classroom. Um, I have to do something about that person with a mask and so that could lead me because I consciously saw them, I knew the rules of the game, that could lead me to do something, what we would call a consciously mediated response arising from a rational consideration of what one is experiencing and what current, one's current goals are. Okay, this is most of the brain processing we're familiar with. This is what we think of as happening a lot. We're pretending to certain things, we're making decisions, we're controlling our behavior in a conscious way. Okay, but at the same time as that is happening, the whole rest of the world, all of the stuff we're not actively attending to is still getting into our brain. It's still imp impinging our ears, all the sounds, you know, we've, there's things touching our skin, there's, you know, all this stimulation around us, and it's all getting into the brain. But we're not conscious, we're only consciously attending to a part of it. What about the rest of that stuff? Well, one thing, and this is related to your learning chapter, through conditioning, operant conditioning, or classical conditioning, or even observational learning, we can learn to associate stimuli with responses. And so certain stimuli just provoke a certain response. So if I was walking over here and, and, and the place was, uh, the doors were closed and I wanted to leave, I might reach out here and do this and not even think. I might be talking to you, I wouldn't even think. And yet there's part of my eyes that would kind of detect where that is and it would put my hand out and control the frontal lobe to open the door so we could walk through. But I, that might never have consciously entered my mind. We were having a conversation and that's where my conscious mind was. And yet, because I've learned the habit of how to deal with these doors over time, probably after a few like bad experiences, <laughs> crash like that, I've learned eventually, okay, this is the right way to do this, um, that becomes an automatic response. And the claim is most of what we do when we're moving around the world and interacting is done on autopilot. We're not thinking about the things, we're just thinking about, you know, what are we gonna do Friday night? Or what's this conversation I'm having? Meanwhile, our brain is processing the world and tr certain things trigger actions. If, it, if you're Pavlov's dog and you hear that bell, you start to drool. And that's not something you're consciously doing, that's something that's just become part of your basic machinery, your Mr. Hyde. Okay, so, so we can respond to the world without consciously doing so in some cases. Let me give you the classic example of this, by the way. It's, it's a really good classic example, except 
Nobody has standard cars anymore where you shift the gears. Um, you still have pedals and stuff, so it's kind of the same. But especially if you know someone that, that's, that has a standard transmission in their car, when they drive, they talk to you. They are constantly doing things like putting the foot on the clutch, shifting the gear, letting go of the brake, adding gas, putting the thing on the clutch. They're not thinking about any of that, right? They're just talking. They're driving from X to Y. All of these behaviors are done by Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde's like, I know how to drive. You taught me how to drive. Like at first, when you were learning, that was, Mr. That was Dr. Jekyll, right? Turn on the blinker, blah, blah, blah. You had to think about every step of driving. And that's exhausting. And you keep worrying you're going to make a mistake. But once you've done it over and over again, it becomes a habit. And Dr. Jekyll says, I got this. You go ahead and talk about Friday night. I got this. If I need you, by the way, I will summon you. So for example, if we suddenly see somebody start walking on the road in front of us, uh, Mr. Hyde might be, hey, Jekyll, Jekyll, pay attention. <laughs> you, you have to pay attention now because you have to do something that I don't know. I just know how to drive, right? And if, if we have to do something unique in this situation, I need you to kind of come take control. So the claim is that a lot of our behaviors are, are reflecting what we call unconscious influences, habitual things, learning that we've done, and may not involve any conscious processing at all. A small subset is being consciously mediated. And there's one other kind of interesting thing. Um, to highlight here, which is that Mr. Hyde doesn't just sort of take care of some behaviors himself, but it also influences how we consciously think about something, but often without us understanding the influence. So the classic example of this would be nonverbal communication. There's a lot of people, there's a claim, I don't know where these numbers come from, and I don't know if it's really scientific, but there's a number out there that 70% of communication is nonverbal. What do we mean by that? Well, we mean that there's so many cues. So let's say, this, let's say we're going to sort of form an impression of this person. This person's going to voice an idea about something, and we're going to have to decide how good their idea is. And that's our conscious mind. Our conscious mind is listening to the idea and kind of thinking about the idea. But in the meantime, this is a slob kind of guy. He lives in a world where there's a lot of dirt, yucky stuff around him, which your unconscious mind probably picks up. And it probably biases what you think about him and how much you trust him. Um, his kinesthetics, maybe he moves in an odd way, or maybe he moves in a very fluent way. You know, if he moves in a very fluent way, you might like him. You might think, ooh, that, that's, that's a smooth operator kind of guy. But if he moves in an odd, spastic way, you might suddenly not trust his words as much without knowing why. Uh, personal appearance, if he doesn't keep up his personal appearance, you might not trust him enough. If he looks really nice, um, you might give him more of a benefit of the doubt. Um, just to give you a sense of this, proxemics is like how close do they come. If they come too close, then, then you might think weirdly of them. Uh, haptics is touching. Um, you know, this is very non-cool these days, right? Um, but, but the idea, especially back in the day, is people used to constantly touch a shoulder or, or touch somebody. Um, and depending on how someone touches you, you're going to... So the claim is all of these things affect whether you're going to... what you're going to think of somebody's idea. You know, they're saying something consciously, and you're thinking about it consciously, but you're perceiving all that other stuff. And it's affecting how you think about what you're experiencing right now. Uh, so those unconscious things, um, although, although you're not consciously aware of them, they color your conscious perception. OK. So we're pretty much there. I just have this one last point I think I want to make uh, on this, and then, and then we're done, um, just to kind of tie it together. So here's the primary point that I hope you leave here with, the understanding that you are two people. You are two distinct people. And one of them is very emotional and primitive, and the other is very sort of sophisticated and whatever, rational. Um, but that more primitive one pl plays a really large role in your life, uh, and much more than you realize. And when you start to think about your behaviors, you might start to realize how many of them reflect Mr. Hyde rather than Dr. Jekyll. Um, in fact, when push comes to shove, definitely, literally, um, Hyde takes over. So the last example here that I just wanted to tie back to the first talk I gave. Um, remember, we were talking about vaccine hesitancy. And my argument was, we've spent too long talking to vaccine-hesitant people rationally. We keep trying to rationalize with them. We tr keep trying to give them data. We keep trying to talk to their Dr. Jekyll. And we keep saying, listen, here's the rational reason why you should get the vaccine. 
but we're not budging anything, right? They, they don't buy it. They're not buying that rational argument. So how do we do, what do we do? Well, one of the things I claimed in that lecture, and I claim quite often, is this is why the vaccine mandates are so important. This is why, you know, oh, well, if you want to get into a restaurant, you want to get into a theater, you have to have proof of vaccine status. What does that do to the anti-vaxxer? It kind of says, you know what, we're no longer going to bother talking to you rationally. We're just going to put you in this awkward situation. You are, you know, you believe what you do about the vaccine for emotional reasons, largely. Fear, paranoia, you think people are trying to control you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's Mr. Hyde talking. And, and that's where you're coming from, is a Mr. Hyde perspective. Okay, but we can put Mr. Hyde against Mr. Hyde. Because if we now say, that's fine, you don't have to have the vaccine, that's all right. If you're worried about it for whatever reason, you don't have to have it. But at the same time, you also can't go to restaurants, you can't do this, you can't do that person's like, but I want to do those things. The Mr. Hyde in the person is like, I want to do those things. I want to socialize. That's part of what I am as a social animal. You know, I want to be out there. And so now we've got part of them that doesn't want the vaccine and another part of them that wants to be out doing stuff. And those are both the Mr. Hydes. So we've now come at them at an emotional level for their emotional position and that's much more challenging for them. And, and I argue, let that do its work. You know, don't, don't worry about the conscious. Don't get into the arguing with, with Dr. Jekyll. Just put them in that emotional position. And I think the desire to be social and to be out there will win out over the fear of the vaccine. Now, I'm not sure that's holding true. <laughs> you know, we're still seeing a lot of stubbornness there. But that's the interesting way you can think about that, is, is, and, and this idea of the emotional versus the rational um, and how you can use it. Okay, that's cool. Thank you. Um, again, it's just been, it's just been um, kind of fun that, that I, I wasn't planning on giving these lectures until the first office hour when people amongst you encouraged me to do it, and I've enjoyed it very much. I, I hope it was uh, kind of cool for you guys, and next term it sounds like you're going to be back full, so I want to wish you guys best of luck while I can actually see you in the, in the face a little bit. Uh, good luck with the exam, good luck with stuff, and I hope you start to get back to a good university experience because you guys have gone through a heck of a lot. So all the best for you guys, and thank you very much. All right, cool, cool.